Thanks a lot for the introduction. So actually, I can probably skip these slides, or almost. Um, so let me just add that it's not only the work of me and Avinash, but there are other co-author and also two students that helped a lot for, uh, for the development. And uh, uh, this is a, a work that would not have been possible without this project financing the, the PhD of Avinash. So, said that, the agenda. So I will, uh, can you hear me? When I move my, okay. Um, I will introduce uh, what multi-party web application are, what is uh, uh, logical vulnerabilities in this multi-party, and then what is the problem that we try to solve. And then Avinash will go into, into the interesting part, so with the, the solution that we try to put in place, the results we got, a demo, hopefully. Uh, and then it will be back to me showing a bit the industrial side uh, of, uh, of this work, some limitation and future work. Okay, so what multi-party web application are? Well, in his uh, general definition, is a service provider web application that uh, provides a service to, to the user, but in doing, in, in doing that relies on a trusted third party. So here you have a few examples, single sign-on, for instance, where you have a user that wants to consume a service. Here is a Gmail. And uh, in order to be authenticated, the user will be redirected to an identity provider. In this case, it's the University of Genoa identity provider. And if everything goes fine, the user will finally get access to his uh, email. And another classical example is uh, cashier as a service. So in here, you have uh, the user that wants to buy a product on this shopping online. And uh, to finalize the payment, perhaps it is uh, redirected to a payment service like PayPal. So these probably are things that we, all of us experience every day, right? And uh, are pretty popular scenarios in nowadays web applications. So here you have some, some numbers. And these numbers are getting higher and higher. So just to provide some more concreteness, uh, let's see a bit more details about one of these scenarios. So you, here you have Alice that uh, wants to access the, the Gmail. And uh, it does a login request, uh, and Gmail uh, replies with what is called an authentication request. So with this authentication request, G Gmail is asking, I don't know who you are, you, who, who you are. please go to the trusted third party, so the user is redirected. And at the trusted third party, the user will have to provide his credentials, uh, username and password. And once that is done, the trusted third party will issue an authentication assertion mm, that is digitally signed by the trusted third party. In this case, it would be the University of Genoa doing that. And inside the authentication assertion, among other parameters, other things, there will be the identity of Alice and the, and the identifier of the service provider. So basically, you are saying this authentication assertion has been issued by this identity provider for Alice that want to access this service provider. So pretty, pretty obvious. Hmm? And, if, and then uh, Alice is redirected back to the service provider if everything goes fine, if the assertion is... Uh, validated somehow by the service provider, at least would get access to the, to the email. So a pretty common scenario. Uh, and uh, however, on this scenario, many vulnerabilities have been reported over the years. Mm -hmm. And many of these vulnerabilities are, are what we call logical vulnerabilities. So what is a logical vulnerabilities? Well, basically, it's a, an incorrect logic of the design implementation of the protocol underlining the scenario. So this could be, yeah, you know, you you just do not bind properly uh, two parameters of the protocol, and therefore the attacker can do something nasty. Here you can see an example. Uh, this, uh, this attack was discovered in 2008, and uh, was for the SAML-based single sign-on of Google applications. And basically what is happening is that uh, the, the, the trusted third party that is deployed in Genoa, but was a trusted third party provided by Google, so it was just a deployment that was done there, uh, was not having uh, uh, the, the service provider field inside the authentication search. So now you can already imagine what can get wrong. So if you see an exploitation of this, we have Alice, that here is the victim, so we, we identify the victim as UV, and uh, uh, is playing the protocol with uh, here a compromised service provider. So a, a service provider that co got compromised by an attacker, right? And uh, at some point, yeah, he will just play the protocol, and what the attacker will do, we start another session. This time is not, th this previous session was between the victim and this service provider 
M that we call service provider malicious to indicate that is uh, compromised by the attacker. And then if we the attacker will start another session here. This time is uh, himself playing with the target service provider. For instance, Gmail. Huh? It's just a man in, a man in the middle here what you have. And so he will do the login request and then he will uh, just replay the assertion that he got here. Uh, and since the assertion doesn't contain the service provider for which it was originally issued, well, the, what happened is that uh, the malicious guy uh, gets authenticated in Gmail as the Alice victim. So, uh, this is just a strategy, and if you see, if you try to formalize it a little bit, it's just a replay attack. A replay attack uh, that uh, concerns the authentication assertion that was issued for the victim while playing with uh, this service provider, Malicious, uh, and we are just replaying it in another session where the malicious guy is playing with the target service provider. Okay? So it's a replay attack. And there are many other attacks of this kind. So here you see an excerpt. You see some, uh, uh, let's say, reference at the end of the slide. You can find the papers where these attacks were discovered. Uh, and are on different scenario, single sign-on, but also payment. Uh, uh, so our idea was, can we try to elaborate a technique such that uh, we can, uh, that is viable and uh, we can uh, discover this kind of attacks in a kind of scenario agnostic way. Because the previous attacks that were reported were always discovered with the different techniques. Here and there, something that was specialized for a specific scenario, something that was specialized for single sign-on or for payment, etc. So can we try to find a, an approach that is easy to be used at the same time able to discover these kind of things? And with that, I leave the floor to Avinash that will go into the, into the solution. Okay. Thank you, Luca. So when we started uh, with the attacks that have been uh, reported in uh, that the, the attacks that have been caused by logical vulnerabilities, we had certain observations. Now let's look at some of them. So our first observation that uh, the strategy that was used behind many of these attacks are the same. So it's probably difficult to see from here, but let's focus on the attack strategy. So if we formalize the attack strategy, you can see that, so this is the attack that we saw just now in Google. So replay uh, the authentication assertion from this type of session in this type of session. So this attack was discovered in 2008, and in 2013, another researcher through formal verification found an attack in Facebook in service providers integrating the Facebook single sign-on solution. And basically, when, if you look at the attack strategy, it's still the same. Just the, instead of the authentication assertion, the, he replayed the access token. So imagine if, when this attack was discovered, and if we had captured this attack strategy in some form, and then, uh, then if this attack strategy was applied to uh, Facebook single sign-on, then we would have identified this attack without using formal verification or uh, without going through the complexity of formal verification. So this is not uh, just a special case because we were also able to see that uh, tech different techniques that have been used to identify attacks in different solution, if you look at the strategy, they're basically the same. So further examples. So another question is, uh, can we exploit the similarity in attack strategy to discover like new attacks in an automatic way? So this is a question. And another observation is, okay, let's say we somehow captured this attack strategy and we have a, a new application we want to test. On which elements are we going to apply this attack strategy? So as you know, all these protocols are based on HTTP protocol. And in HTTP protocol, there are a lot of elements like cookies, referral header, and a lot of parameters in the cookies. So if we want to, up the, the ideal case is we can apply attack strategy in all these elements. But can we do it in a smarter way? So uh, if, how, if then we looked at the security critical elements in the protocol and their properties in the HTTP traffic. For instance, another researcher has pointed out that uh, the uniqueness of each HTTP element is, an in, is a very interesting concept. So we look through that angle. For instance, uh, let's take the case of the login request. User is sending his username and password to the trusted third party. So it contains the username and password. 
and this is a security critical parameter and these are user unique. So another user executing the same protocol will have different values, but for the same user, it's going to have always the same values. And then another interesting concept is session uniqueness. So this authentication request and the authentication assertion, these are very important security critical parameters. Their value changes in each session. Then another question that can come to your mind is, okay, but the cookie is also session unique, so if we apply the attack on cookies, it's not going to work. So we need something more than these uh, uniqueness properties. So for that, we identify another interesting property which is related to the data flow property of these security critical elements. For instance, if you look at this, uh, uh, this security critical element, it is flowing from the service provider to the trusted third party. If you look at the traffic, we can see that. Similarly, if you look at the authentication assertion, we can, we'll see that it is flowing from the trusted third party to the service provider. So now we know that it is possible that we can understand from the HTTP traffic of the underlying protocol which attack strategy we can apply. Now the third observation. Okay, so we have an attack strategy, we have a protocol under test, and we know which are the interesting elements in which we can apply the attack strategy. So now we, after applying the attack strategy, we should know whether the attack worked. So one option is either we can ask the tester, okay, did the attack work? I tried this. But if there are 100 attack strategies, we cannot always bother the tester. So can we somehow automatically determine whether the applied attack strategy was successful? So to answer this question, uh, if, the, so this is the attack that we saw earlier. So when the authentication assertion was replayed, when the attack worked, the service provider or the, uh, the, the, the trusted service provider replied with welcome Alice message. So this message or this pattern will be returned in a proper session between uh, Alice and the service provider. So when this was replayed, it returned this pattern. So if we, if we extend the attack strategy, so we can extend this attack strategy considering this, uh, what we call as the flag of a session. So replay uh, this uh, authentication assertion in this session and get this flag. So this is now the strategy that we can use to not only perform the attack, but also check whether the attack really was really successful. So, so as I said, uh, this pattern, it can be in the, directly in the HTTP traffic, or it can be something in the DOM, which is like uh, executed by a JavaScript and which is like uh, displayed in the DOM. Now, another observation that we made was most of the attack that were uh, reported in the past were considering the threat model in which the attacker can play the role of a malicious user or that of a malicious service provider. And in order to execute all these attacks, mo major, the attacks that we considered, we just need four nominal sessions. So the victim user is uh, executing the protocol with uh, a, a benign service provider. The attacker is executing the protocol with uh, the benign service provider. Similarly, these two users executing the protocol with the malicious service provider or a different service provider. So if we have this uh, HTTP traffic from these four sessions, we can basically reproduce these attacks. So another question is, they consider these threat model now, what if we consider the threat model in which the user, malicious benign user, and the malicious user shares the same browser? That's what we call the browser history attacker threat model. So in this, we don't, imagine, we don't consider the case that the user does not log out from the session, so he log, logs out from his session, but he does, not, he does not clear the browser history. So the attacker can see the browser, the history of the uh, victim. So this threat model was considered in this, uh, in, while analyzing multi-party web applications. So we thought, okay, let's consider this scenario and see what happens. So now that we have all the attacks, we found that many attacks have similarities. So how can we convert all our observations into something called attack patterns? So let's focus on these two attacks, the attack in Google and Facebook service provider. So let's formalize them. So in both these attacks, two different elements were replayed. So if you generalize them, let's call it a fancy name. Let's call it uh, replay attack one. So the strategy is replay an element X from this type of session in this type of session. 
So what should be the property of this uh, element X? So this element X should flow from the trusted third party to the service provider, and this element should be session unique or user unique. So if we focus on these elements in the protocol and perform this attack strategy, and we get a flag which, is, which, is, which belongs to that of this session, for example, welcome Alice, then we have an attack. So this is how we convert these, uh, these concrete attacks into attack patterns. We continued this exercise for a lot of different attacks. For instance, this is the attack that we saw just now. Sometimes attacks can be really complicated. For instance, uh, we don't have to get into the details, but if you see the attack strategy, let's start from the bottom up. There is a replay attack to get an element Y, and that element Y is replayed in another session. So there is a nested replay, and these are the conditions. So these are inspired from different attacks that have been reported in the past. So, and this, so these attacks were inspired from previous attacks, but this is the attack that we modeled through by considering the browser history attacker. So, now let's go to our approach. Our approach consists of two phases. The first phase you already saw. We acted as security experts, surveying attacks from the literature, identifying similarities, and creating attack patterns. We can also consider new threat models and create attack patterns. Now there is somebody who is like a tester who has, who has a multi-party web application to test. So he is basically applying these attack patterns to detect attacks. So what he should do, he should provide what we call configuration and recording. To, so what, is of, what we offer is a security testing framework. So to our framework, he should provide a configuration. And what should be this configuration? This configuration is basically, he should provide an implementation of the solution. And then he should uh, provide what we call the user actions to uh, belonging to the four different nominal sessions. So basically by executing these user actions, we are reproducing these uh, four different types of sessions. So once this input is given to our security testing framework, we automatically perform what we call inference. So in this inference, we execute the protocol, we identify what are the security critical elements, we identify their properties. And then in the next step, what we do is we apply these attack patterns. So we uh, check the precondition, apply the attack strategy, and check whether the attack strategy was successful. And then if it was successful, we report it to the tester, and the tester can check whether the attack was, is indeed uh, true. So this is a uh, architecture of our implementation, and uh, we are proud to say that we used OWASP SAP uh, for our uh, implementation. So this is uh, our implementation of the inference and the attack pattern engine. Basically, our attack pattern, uh, our uh, testing engine depends on OWASP SAP to collect HTTP traffic, uh, to execute user actions, and to manipulate the traffic like an attacker, and send it to the multi-party web application under test. So, now that we have a security framework, and we used our security framework to analyze different real world applications, and we had some interesting results. So first of all, uh, since we considered the browser history attacker threat model, we discovered two attacks in, for instance, let's take this attack in developer.linkedin.com, in which we found out that even after a user logs out, there are some values in the browser history for instance, uh, the uh, member ID parameter, and the attacker just needs these two information in order to log in as the victim. Similarly, uh, some attacks that were reported in uh, single sign-on, we created attack patterns from them, we applied to the payment scenario, and we discovered at, uh, new attacks. Not only in payment scenario, but also in other scenarios like the registration via email. Similarly, we found interesting attacks in prominent applications like Pinterest.com, and these attacks were uh, these attacks that we applied were inspired from totally different uh, single sign-on protocols. And for most of them, we received acknowledgments, and for some of them, we did not receive acknowledgment. We have anonymized their names, and uh, an attack was reported in uh, OS Commerce to checkout integration. We created an attack pattern, and we found the same attack in the latest version of uh, OpenCart, just by using our tool. 
And with all these results, we published a paper in uh, this year's uh, NDS symposium that happened in February. And now let's see a demo of our tool. So in this demo, what we'll be seeing is the cashier as a service scenario, the payment checkout scenario. We'll be testing the latest version of OS Commerce. I believe up to yesterday, it was, this was the latest version. And what we'll be testing is the uh, two checkout, two checkout is like a, a payment uh, service provider. So we'll be testing this scenario. So as I said earlier, the tester should create the, uh, should provide the configuration and recording to our uh, testing framework. So let's switch to our tool. So this is the UI of our tool. We have some issues with the, con uh, with the resolution, but I think it should be fine. So he wants to create a new test. So he creates a new test. And as I said, uh, he should provide user actions uh, and flags. So how can he provide these user actions? There are a lot of uh, technologies available to tackle this scenario. So this is the application that we want to test, which is OS Commerce. So he can use uh, something like uh, the Selenium plugin in order to uh, record the user action. For instance, he can, uh, whatever actions he performs will be recorded by the plugin. We enhanced it uh, to support, uh, to, to make it more robust. So let's say uh, he starts like, uh, and he signs in and then adds a product and then continues to check out and he selects to check out as the um, uh, payment service provider and basically he will be redirected to the payment service provider. As you can see all the actions that he performs will, is recorded here and he just provides submits the payment. And the, the shopping was successful, so he can use this string uh, in order to, as a indicator to say that um, this is, uh, this string can be used in order to uh, say that the uh, protocol is successfully executed. So after recording these user actions, basically he uploads uh, user actions corresponding to um, each of these uh, sessions and then uh, he will have to provide the flag that he identified like uh, it has been processed. So we don't have the time to run the whole test because it takes like 40 minutes. So I will show you a report of what will happen if he uploads the uh, user actions and runs the test. So what will happen after, uh, the, after he provides the configuration and recording is our tool performs the inference and identifies the properties of the security critical elements. So I'm taking an already run test and this is the result of the inference. As you can see, it has automatically identified a lot of interesting elements and the properties of these and the properties of these elements such as uh, some of them are uh, like uh, user unique and it flows from the service provider to the trusted third party and also the trusted third party to the service provider, which, where is this element located, which is the URL of this element, etc. And then after inference, uh, it applies each attack patterns and reports the attack. So let's see an attack report. So it says, uh, the tool says it applied uh, four different attack strategies and it found an attack for RA3. So what is RA3? So just to recap, RA3 is execute uh, the protocol, get an element and reuse it in another session. So in the context of OS Commerce, it is purchase a product, get some elements, payment tokens, replay it in a new uh, payment purchase and you can reach the end. That means you can pay once and shop multiple times. So 
in this case, it tried different combinations. It tried to replay different elements, and this was the combination. So the elements key and order from one session can be replayed in another payment session, and he can buy products for free. So this information, we believe, is sufficient for the attacker, for the tester, to reproduce the attack and verify that the attack was, uh, is not a false positive. And also the input from the, the output of the inference is really sufficient to create new attacks because he knows the details of the security critical parameters. So with that, I move the session to Luca. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Avinash. Uh, yeah, time is getting, is running out, actually. So let's <coughs> quickly look at, uh, uh, yeah, the industrial side. So basically, we, we are using this tool at SAP at the moment, this prototype, actually, because it's a research prototype. And we have done some pilots with a few business units. And uh, one of these is uh, we have a, an e-commerce uh, solution on the cloud. It's called SAP Hybris e-commerce. Um, and that was uh, successful, but I mean, we are still evaluating whether indeed uh, in the company we have many of these scenarios and how we what we can do with this tool. And one of the things we are working on is for sure improving the usability. So the interface that you just saw was released, I think, today morning. Today, <laughs> two days ago. So, <laughs> and it's still, uh, you know, you, you need to create all the management that is around, etc. So usability is for sure something we have to work on. Uh, concerning the availability of the prototype, so the moment is available at SAP only. Um, so, however, I mean, and we are still dis discussing what should be the delivery model for, uh, for the prototype. It's one of the options is to, to give it as open source. Uh, uh, so in case you have a scenario uh, and uh, that fits this multi-party case and you would like to validate, well, reach out, reach out to us and we can see what, what we can do. Uh, so what was some limitation in future direction? I mean, what you have seen is a, a set of strategies that we put in place. The, 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 the nice thing is that we know exactly what we are testing and what we are not testing. Uh, however, we don't, I mean, claiming full coverage would be not possible, right? So uh, as many other approaches, it's not complete. Uh, however, there is some research question that might be interesting. So can we reach full coverage for replay attacks? I mean, replay attacks, in principle, naively, I could just start replaying everything, right? And waiting. Uh, at some point, it will finish, and it will tell me I was trying to replay this, this, and that, and it didn't find anything. So in principle, you could do that. It's probably not viable as a solution. So the, the, the interesting question would be, can you reach full coverage for replay attacks in a viable manner? Hmm? And this is something we like to, to investigate a bit more. Uh, another thing is observability. So what you have seen is that our tool acts as a, a proxy on the client side. So we can just observe what is happening between uh, the two uh, entities, so the service provider and the trusted third party, on the client side. So if there is any backend communication between uh, the service provider and the identity provider, we would not see that, right? And there are protocols, I mean, there was an interesting presentation just before about OpenID Connect. There are protocols where indeed that happens. So it might be important also to, to work on this. So for instance, to, pr to put a proxy on the server side also, and to see, uh, and to be able to combine uh, these, these two uh, source of information uh, for the inference and for the application of the strategy. Um, so in conclusion, yeah, we have identified seven attack patterns. Uh, uh, we have a prototype for black box security testing of this uh, uh, logical flow. Oh, we have still 10 minutes. OK. Well, then we have a lot of time for questions. Uh, it's based on OWASP. And uh, uh, we were able to discover quite a number of uh, new unknown uh, vulnerabilities. If you are interested in the technical details, read through the paper, reach out, reach out to us. We are here for the entire conference, so it will be a pleasure to talk with you. And yeah, industrial exploitation is ongoing. Thanks a lot. Any questions? Wait, wait, wait. You shall wait. As you're heading out, there are there are red and green cards at the back. Please put one into the bucket to let us know what you think of the talk. Thank you. So I'd like to ask, is your tool publicly available? Uh, yeah, well, it's what I tried to say before. Um, at the moment, it's only available at SAP, so our company. Uh, and uh, however, if you have a scenario that you would like to, to validate, uh, reach out uh, to us, approach us, and we can see what we can do. All right. Okay. Questions?
are your attack patterns publicly available? Well, the attack patterns are available, right? Are written in the paper. So in our case, we're a Python script. So you can just re-implement. Uh, however, I mean, I must say that uh, we, we patented the, the solution. So the intellectual property is somehow protected. Uh, but yeah, the, 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 let's say the, uh, the attack patterns are publicly available. So they are not uh, hidden. Cool, thanks. Questions? Yeah, I have one question. Uh, what of the uh, 21 uh, unknown vulnerabilities did you found? What are these kind of vulnerabilities in the single sign-on protocol? Yeah, just to, gi just to give you a few ideas. Uh, something interesting that we found was uh, in the Stripe checkout protocol. So we found out that uh, you pay to a uh, at an online shop without providing your credit card details and the shop just gets a token. It is possible for a malicious shop to use your, to get a token belonging to you and use the token to go to like uh, tesla.com and buy a car with your details. So you don't provide your credit card details to the, card, uh, to the shop directly but still the shop is able to purchase things from your card through the uh, through the uh, trusted third party. And then some of the, another thing we found in uh, Pinterest is if both of us are in the same network, then uh, Pinterest is protected with HTTPS, but still somehow I can manage to get your access token by monitoring the traffic. Uh, it's not so, uh, so straightforward like uh, directly checking your login session. It's like I have to send you a URL. If you click on it, I will it, your access token will be exposed to the network and I can use that to log in as you in Pinterest. So these are some of the examples. You can read the paper for more details. Any more questions? Questions? I, I have one if I may. <clears throat> the emerging identity access management protocols, you know, legacy SAML, OAuth, and OIDC, they all encourage you to put <coughs> heavily sensitive data in a URI, yet the secure coding guidelines usually say never put sensitive data in a URI even over HTTPS because they leak all over the place. Browser history, refers, the server logs. So do you think this is a fundamental problem with all these next generation protocols? And is there anything else, anything we can do about it? Again, my concern is we're putting access tokens that, that, that uh, bear access tokens that by themselves provide major access and similar in URIs, which seems crazy to me. Any thoughts on that? We can enforce like uh, restrictions like don't send it uh, to the URI, send it as like post message, etc. But these are like nice guidelines that the developer sees and it's up to him to implement them. So even if we restrict a lot of things, we still have limitations. So these protocols should work in the browser environment. So even in the case of URIs, they provide, okay, when you're sending the access token, use the hash parameter so that it's never sent to the network even though it's present in the URI. But still there are like attacks that can like, using cross-site scripting, you can extract these tokens and all this. So it's, it, that's how the web is. So you have to live with that. That was a depressing answer, but. <laughs> a any other questions? Questions? So my question is, are you considering to cover more advanced attacks, like for example, a user shouldn't make a number of orders per day, um, uh, some constraints of that type, some logic, uh, really advanced uh, rules made by the business? Uh, if, if I heard you properly, you want to say like how, whether we can detect, whether we can detect like advanced attacks or like how to model them? My question is, uh, could you cover advanced logic rules? Like example, for example, a user shouldn't make number of orders per day. Uh, when a user makes an order, he shouldn't make a mix between two different products of that type. Something like that made by the business. So could you, could you be able to cover something like that? 
or it depends on the protocol you're yeah, it's, it really depends on the most prominent attacks that were discovered. So we focused on a subset of them. Of course, we could not like target all these attacks, but in future we are like as that's why we are, when we are doing pilots, we'll see more scenarios, and that's why we have the possibility. So to yeah, you have the flexibility of adding new yeah. scenarios. So yes, yes. We ha it's it's like you just add a new file as an attack pattern, include them, and then uh, you can check for this attack. More questions. Questions. Gentlemen, thank you so much for such a fantastic talk. Round of applause.